everybody. Thank you for joining us on the postseason episode 11 of The Kicking Show, brought to you by Kicking the Tires. We've got Justin, we've got Seth, Matt, and Zach in the same camera shot together. And Sarah is joining us tonight all the way up in the chilly uh, regions of Rhode Island, and she's going to stay awake for the whole show. So <laughs> we're happy that you're joining us. And, uh, you know, we had one heck of a weekend out in Phoenix, some great championships, uh, you know, battled out. We got Sheldon Creed as a winner, Austin Cindric as a winner, and NASCAR's golden boy, Chase Elliott, NASCAR Cup Series champion. Take it away, Justin, and tell us what can we can expect for the rest of the show before I screw it up again. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, we're going to talk about the three champions for 2020 in NASCAR, Sheldon Creed, Austin Cindric, and as you said, Chase Elliott, which, uh, man, I'll tell you what. Last time an Elliott won a cup championship was 1988 with his dad, Bill Elliott. Let me guess. Bill Elliott was the NASCAR's not, NMPA most popular driver. He was. But okay. here's a couple other stats with that. The Los Angeles Lakers and the Los Angeles Dodgers also won their respective championships slash World Series that same year. Here we are in 2020. Los Angeles Lakers and Los Angeles Dodgers win their championships and an Elliott wins the cup championship so it, and oh, I'll add what he I'll, about and I'll add one more thing in 1988 the number 9 car won the cart championship 2020 Scott Dixon in the 9 car wins the Indy car championship I wonder what else is going to finish off like like <laughs> who was the F1 champion in 1988 i'm curious about that nobody cares either (laughs) (laughs) not on this podcast uh i'm I'm just curious though f1 to quote eddie gossage f1 doesn't give me a credential so i don't care Ayrton senna (laughs) Ayrton senna yeah so Ayrton senna won and what card number was he driving just out of curiosity hmm Chase Elliott say something like stats are for Luke. number 12 that year the number yes. 12 all yes. right so now here's the real question 2020 championship standings for the f1 series uh standings it was Lewis Hamilton, wasn't it? Always it, it's Lewis Hamilton and he's driving the 44 yeah, dang it i mean like <laughs> <laughs> sorry you can't even oh 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 but he does have 11 podiums so if he can get what one more right 12 or the 14 right cares it's <laughs> f1 yeah it goes all... like it goes like this hey guys we have to let him win because it's team orders man i feel like f1 like i i'm a huge fan of open wheel because because you guys know i do karting i'm a huge fan of open wheel but man i just wish they would get those computers out of those cars let the drivers drive them Anyway, not talented enough. That's why we have real drivers in NASCAR. <laughs> there you go. Well, supposedly, supposedly they'll have fewer computers in 2023. And, and if I ever, and if I thought ever thought that I was getting an F1 uh, credential, that's pretty much out the window <laughs> after this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. All right. Uh, but going on, we'll talk about that. We'll talk about the uh, the nine people that fell short for the championship. Jimmy Johnson caps off his career with the top five finish. Uh, but I'll tell you what, silly season ain't over yet. Daniel Hemrick gets a ride in 2021. We'll be talking about who he's going with. And then we'll be talking about Brett Moffitt's new ride in 2021. <laughs> as well as one driver who, well might not have a ride next year after suspension uh jerry broke that story uh earlier this week and then last week also right at the end on friday uh jerry you released a pretty cool article uh interviewing uh steve phelps as he kind of recapped uh overcoming the quote difficult covid season so i've been through three races and i don't know how many articles that i've written since then um but I remember a little bit about that article and he said this was like the toughest season in NASCAR history to be able to get everything together and to get us back racing. But they were determined. And I do have to give them credit. Um, as much grief as I give NASCAR, uh, they have done a, a great job in, in rounding out this season and getting us on track and keeping us uh, with the championship, you know, events in, in Phoenix and, 
hey, we're done. The year is over. We get to kind of relax, except for something that uh, we'll talk about in just a little bit with Zach going to on Monday. Yeah. Uh, so let's talk about the championship drivers first. Uh, so Sheldon Creed getting the 2020 championship in the NASCAR Gander Outdoors Truck Series. Uh, I'm going to bow out for a little bit because I – didn't have any winning picks and y'all probably did so y'all talk about the uh the trucks and the uh, and xfinity for a little bit and i'll just sit here and listen and, and be educated <laughs> <laughs> all right so we'll talk about trucks first uh I'll, I'll just open the floor if anyone wants to uh kind of chime in on that well it, it was an interesting race to say the least brett moffitt dominated and it came down to a pit call at the very end uh whether who took tires and who didn't moffitt didn't Sheldon Creed did I think Creed lined up 11th and went from 11th to first in one lap uh which as TV said and as Sheldon said it was like one of those uh uh land rushes at the start of a off-road truck series race which is Sheldon's background for him uh to go and pass that main trucks in two corners yeah, it was just another one of those late risky moves that we've seen from that uh, from that two truck team. Uh, some some of them have worked out well, but some of them haven't. You know, Darlington was one of them where he was out and away with the win, and then a late caution, he goes to pit road, and he's just done from there. And he got a pit road penalty on top of it, but this one he was able to get a good pit stop in, and uh, I think he lined up. He said 11th, it may have been around eighth or ninth. It was I, I forget where he was um, for the choose cone, but. Had a fantastic restart. I mean, he just turned that thing left and went straight to the bottom. Mm -hmm. I mean, it almost looked like a dirt race because of all of the dust flying up. And uh, somehow those tires those tires uh, cut in and he got past. Uh, I, mean, I thought Chandler Smith was going to win for a second there, but <laughs> uh, granted, thing was behind him and they had a little bit of contact. Creed came in and somehow made it through turn three and four and, that, and came out with the lead. Um, as you said, Seth, there was one lap and just probably the best lap of his life. I think he was eighth before the uh, choose V and ended up 11th because he chose the inside. Uh, I think that was actually one of the first times I've seen more people choose the inside than it being a, an even split between the two lanes. Yeah, and I also wonder, too, like how much his team and his crew chief paid attention to Grant Enfinger. Because if you remember, Grant Enfinger had... Um, uh, had taken a pit stop earlier and and pretty much drove straight through the entire field. I think they caught on to that and uh, knew that the tires were going to be best on that on that green white checkered there. Yeah, he was going to make a close on Moffitt if I remember correctly. He was, I mean, it was like three and a half seconds, three seconds, but he was eating into that lead by a few tenths each lap. Um, but I mean, Moffitt had a big enough lead. He definitely had it won if it wasn't going to be for a cut tire or something like that. So. That, that was the one negative of that finish. It was so incredible, but you always hate when someone's out and away with... You hate when they're out and away with a win, but when it comes down to a race win and a championship, um, I really don't care that he's won it before. I don't care who it is. It's, it's always really tough to see. So mm -hmm. I fell for him, but, I mean, you can't say anything about Creed. Not only did he earn it uh, this Friday night, but he's earned it the whole season. I mean, he was the winningest driver of the year, and uh, he was my pick. I think he was a few others' picks to the title, so... I mean, it went to a good guy, at least. Um, <clears throat> I actually didn't see the race. Um, I ended up, I forget why, probably was asleep. But um, he was my only correct pick. Out well, of I know the why you didn't. You, I know why you didn't see it. Because you didn't have the Xfinity app until the next day. Oh, well, Saturday, yeah, that's yeah, right. But I probably was. I, th yeah. I was in bed, too. But um, when I put my picks on Twitter, he was the only, he's the only one I got right. Um, so I saw highlights from the race. I mean, it seemed like a really good race, but at least I got one out of three right on the weekend because, yeah, he was my only I, right pick. I, I, I want to point something out real quick um, before NASCAR Karen comes on and starts blowing us up on uh, YouTube. <laughs> By the way, like and follow and subscribe on YouTube. Mm -hmm. um, but Zach and Matt are sitting next to each other with no mask on, but they've been together like in the same car and hotel room for the past week. So yeah. if they're exposed to COVID, then it happened days ago because they were out in Phoenix together. They've been to Vegas together. And so, yeah, so before anybody freaks out, 
I just want to put that out there to protect you guys because I know what can happen when somebody gets mad at you on Twitter. <laughs> This is how close we've been for the past like five days. So. <laughs> <laughs> now, I was going to say, uh, Sheldon Creed was also my only correct pick, although I didn't actually get to pick him on the podcast because we went through picks so quickly last week. Uh, I ended up picking him after the podcast, quoting uh, Lewis and just uh, essentially piggybacking off of Lewis Frank's pick. And yeah. uh, it turned out to be the yeah. right idea. When he tweet shamed me, I saw that actually. <laughs> tweet shamed me for skipping over him. Yeah, okay. <laughs> no comment. Pretty much. Well, Sheldon Creed, uh, congratulations to you and your team. Uh, fantastic drive. Yeah, Louis Frank, uh, who was on our show last weekend, and or last week, I should say, and had that pick, um, especially for coming from Robbie Gordon's uh, race uh, race series with the uh, big trucks. So um, good run there. Going on to uh, Xfinity, despite having probably all the numbers for him, Chase Briscoe not only couldn't get the de deal done, but finished fourth in the championship running at Phoenix. And Austin Sindrick takes home the title in that 22 Penske Ford for the NASCAR Xfinity series. And that was impressive as well. Uh, again, Sindrick and Allgaier were the two dominant drivers, uh, which for Phoenix, when isn't Allgaier out front? Uh, although, as Allgaier said, he was out front for the wrong 76 laps. Uh, but I didn't know it until the post-race Zoom. Uh, Roger Penske had actually considered shutting the team down mm -hmm. during the COVID break. So... Kudos to Roger for not shutting it down because who knows what would have happened where Cindric would have ended up if it had shut down. Yeah, I was just about to mention the same thing because it's easy to say, oh, cool, uh, Allgaier would have been the winner. But you look at these other names up here, Noah Gragson, Brandon Jones, Michael Annette, those are three other drivers that beat out Allgaier that could have easily taken that last spot. So, Except there's one thing. And Austin talked about it. And he was kind of aware that they were talking about shutting down the team. But he said he wasn't really totally worried about it because he went to Roger early, you know, at the beginning of the year when they were all talking. And Roger made a commitment to run that team for Austin. And, you know, when Roger Penske gives you his word, he it's like gold. And, you know, uh, so Austin wasn't overly – concerned about it but obviously there's finances there's things that you have to do but to his credit his dad tim sendrick has taken a very hands-off approach in austin's complete career he's kind of he said he wanted to stay his dad not his you know the go-between <laughs> yeah. with with the penske organization so uh so kudos to him because i think that a lot of people think that austin gets everything he handed to him because of his dad and that could couldn't be further from the truth and we heard mm -hmm. roger penske you know say just that so um, that was a that was a great win. I was I was watching that on the restart um, from the press box. Man, he got a jump, and and I thought honestly, I thought Noah Gragson was gonna gonna mess it all up, and either he was gonna win the race or <laughs> cause everybody to wreck. But <laughs> Noah did a heck of a job running the race and finishing the race the way he did, and Austin did a heck of a job driving it and just you know not letting up and just going down and. And hoping that it stuck and it did yeah it was kind of similar to the truck race and that it was that those last two lap shootouts to the end which you always hope for for a champion but what happened with moffitt didn't happen to sindrick here sindrick was out out in the lead you know he looked very strong to win the win the title um i thought all guy early was better but i mean he just started losing it even with fresher tires on one run uh, sindrick was still able to hold him off um, and then for that last restart, Sindrick ends up, you know, a few goes back. And I'm like, oh, man, it's too bad for him. But he had that, that epic one lap, uh, that one lap string there. And he made a little bit of contact with our guy. I, I agree when I saw uh, Graxon with the seven up front. I'm like, oh, yeah, we might see a little bit of blocking here. I mean, it's, it's kind of two on one. Um, but, I mean, our 22 is just so good. And just that little bit of contact he made to make it, uh, I think, three wide through the dog leg. That was just the perfect move and he just had the better race car better tires at the point so it was just it was his to win and again just just like Creed I mean he was just such a phenomenal driver 
all year. I mean, this is his third year, I believe, in Xfinity, and each year he's gotten progressively better. Um, he went from winless his first year, but decent numbers. Two wins last year, but only on road courses. And this year he gets half a dozen wins. I think five out of six at one point. Um, he, he was on fire during the summer um, and made his way to the playoffs and then ends up winning it right at the end. So um, given that he has another year in Xfinity next year, I mean, I, I can't see how he can get any better, but um, I, I suppose he can because he's, he's yet to dip down. He's only gotten better every year. The only uh, playoff driver we haven't talked about so far, at least for the Xfinity series, is Justin Haley, who honestly was a bit of a non-factor at Phoenix but he didn't have his normal pit crew. Uh, his normal pit crew, which is Matt Kenseth's Cup Series pit crew, was actually inactive due to a COVID positive test. So he had Sheldon Creed's championship winning pit crew, Bubba Wallace's Cup pit crew, pitting mm-hmm. him during the Xfinity race. So they actually had a chance to win a championship two days in a row. I don't know if maybe uh, their choreography just didn't, wasn't accustomed to an Xfinity car since they usually do cup and truck, not Xfinity, but it his pit stops weren't really that far off of his competitors, so I don't know if they just missed the setup or what was going on with his team. Um, I mean, I think the Xfinity series all year proved that it was one of the best series to watch. I thought it was fun to watch all season. Um, I never really found a race that was not exciting. Uh, I am surprised that Briscoe he was my pick. I am surprised that he didn't come through with it. But like Zach said, Cindric was strong all year too. So he was definitely a top pick up there as well. And it'll be exciting to see what he does next season too, because I don't, I can see multiple wins again for sure. Definitely. All right. Well then I guess uh, we got one more series to go through and that's the cup series. And did any of us pick Chase Elliott to win it? I don't, no, don't um, think so. No, uh, I actually, um, so I would like to apologize to Chase Elliott Nation because <laughs> <laughs> if, if we remember correctly, I forget what podcast it was. I don't remember. Um, I didn't pick him to go very far at all, and I thought I was going to get hate tweets. Like, I was waiting for it. I was waiting for them to just come at me. Um, So I would just like to apologize to them that I was wrong, very wrong. Um, He clearly won the championship. But, um, yeah, I mean, he just – it didn't even factor in that I – he started from the back, and I wasn't Uh even concerned. I knew he was going to get up there. I mean – he has had a very, very good car. Um, he got the big plate. Oh, I'm yeah. sorry. Did I say that? I'm, I didn't mean to say that out loud. <laughs> but it, uh, honestly, it did feel a little bit like 2016 when uh, Jimmy Johnson was failed uh, pre-race tech, started from the rear, and went on to win the race and the championship. And Jimmy uh, actually like told him that before the race. He's like, yeah. hey, you got to worry about it. doesn't matter if you start in the back. It's a long race. Actually... This race was shorter than the race we had at Homestead in 2016 because this was a 312-mile lap, 500 kilometers, and Homestead was a 500-mile race. So he did it in two-thirds the time, you know, two-fifths, three-fifths the time. Yeah, three-fifths, roughly. Yeah, I think it was lap 28 or so when he broke into the top 10. 27. Uh, I, I tweeted it. Okay. <laughs> I wasn't off by much. I wasn't off by much. But uh, the close, I think the closest any of us came, I know I had uh, said uh, the system favors first time champions, but I leaned towards Hamlin with his experience. Uh, but uh, I don't think anyone actually picked Chase outright. Well, I told the NASCAR That's... core media this past week that I picked that for Harvick not to make the Final Four, and I thought I had like seven heads or something. They were, they were just <laughs> dumbfounded and stunned. Like, how could you do that? And I'm like, I just did. So <laughs> crazy. Had it, and it worked. Maybe it'll work next year too. Yeah, I think the field should be lucky that Chase Elliott didn't start on the pole like he was supposed to. I mean, he was inside the top ten before the competition caution even hit. So mm-hmm. I can only imagine 
how many cars would have been on the lead lap at the end or he, he just was on fire on the bottom. I mean, his car was stuck on the bottom and everyone else is kind of running the middle to a little bit of high lane and like just sitting there watching him pilot around right there on the bottom, just flying through the field was just really impressive. Yeah, and if it wasn't for Logano's dominance up front, I mean, I think it took until past lap 100 because uh, Joey led so much at the beginning of the race. Uh, that's when Elliot ended up breaking the lead. And at that point, we're like, I mean, we're sitting in the stands. I mean, people are just, I mean, you know, Elliot, he's the most popular driver. So, I mean, we had these, we had people all around us who were just standing up cheering during every pass. And he started in the back, so that was a lot of cheering. <laughs> and uh, once he finally got that lead, um, they were going nuts. I mean, it was just by far the most popular champion of the year. Um, definitely the most popular championship in decades, I would say. Yeah. Uh, Jimmy's 2016 was really close um, just because of the moment. Uh, but this was like a different type of excitement. It was it was a young champion. You know, that's something we don't get too often in Cup. I mean, it's his fifth year. And um, like the other champions this year, they had amazing seasons. But um, not many people pick them to win the title. Um, it's rare to see a Hendrick car or a Chevrolet make the final four at all. Uh, so just seeing this happen was, was a big deal for a lot of people. And um, to see him just earn it straight out. I mean, there was no last pit stop strategy. There was no drivers having cut tires, no last pits, no last uh, restart. I mean, it was green the entire last stage and uh, he just he just won it. So that was exciting to see for the fans and it was uh, refreshing to see a, a new face up front. Yeah, I was going to say, like when you mentioned the uh, Hendrick cars, that's the first time uh, we've seen a Hendrick car in the final four since, I think since the whole, you know, uh, yeah. the whole breakdown of every, you know, every three races being eliminated uh, and then kind of resetting everything um, started. Uh, the last time was Jimmy Johnson in 2016, and and by winning this championship over the last 16 years or 26 years, I should say, uh, he's kept Rick Hendrick at a 50% odd of winning the championship. I don't know if people realize that, but out of the last 26 years, Rick Hendrick has won 13 championships. That and speaking to the popularity uh, as well, uh, with Chase being the reigning most popular driver. He is only the sixth reigning most popular driver to win the championship while having that honor. Bill Elliott was the most recent in 1988. Uh, and I actually tweeted this out. Bobby Allison in 83, Richard Petty twice, J Joe Weatherly and Lee Petty were the only other two. Which I was actually a little surprised that that club was as small as it is. But then again, thinking about it with how often Bill Elliott won that honor and how often Richard Petty won that honor, it's not as surprising as I originally thought. Well, doesn't, doesn't Bill have it with like 15 16 years, times? 16, some, yeah, 16 times. It's like one less, one more than Junior. And then, you know, Junior had it forever and never won a championship. Um, so, yeah. But that plays right into NASCAR's, you know, storybook ending of a 2020 season. You know, as bad as things were throughout the season, uh, as as Steve Phelps talked about, they had one heck of a finish. Chase Elliott coming from the back, the most popular driver winning the championship, and two walk off wins. That's like yeah. walk. That's like walk off home runs in the World Series. Well, back to back games, bottom well, of the actually, ninth. <laughs> actually, you could make the argument it was three walk off wins because. He also had to win at the Roval to advance, and won at the Roval too. Yeah, but it wasn't three in a row. Mm, true. Martin's yeah, I, villain. So I guess Martin's a walk-off home run in game one, and then game six and seven. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, mean, I, I could see that. I so, could see that. So One thing interesting about the race was how much of a non-factor Kevin Harvick was. I mean, it makes me wonder that if he was in the championship four, if he would have had the contention as the other people. And I was listening to an interview with uh, Steve O'Donnell after the race, and he said that if Kevin Harvick just went out, whacked the field, won the race, that it would have been a tough pill for them to swallow. But of course, they're they're really happy with Chase Elliott winning and um, the race playing natural. They didn't have any green-white checkers, um, no freak accidents, even though 
Joey Logano admitted after the race that he thought about bringing up the yellow. He said that to Sirius XM the other day. So, but he also said he didn't have the heart to do it because that's not the kind of racer he is. Exactly. And yeah. just like I don't believe, just like I don't believe that Kevin Harvick sandbagged for the entire race either, which was also put out there on social media. <laughs> right. Yeah. No. I. I, like personally I have a lot of respect for Joey to do that because he could have easily done that and given either himself or even Brad a better opportunity to have a short run to go after Chase but um um kudos to Joey because you know it's it's tempting to manipulate a race like that but to have that kind of integrity um he says thank you speaks highly of his character <laughs> and also kudos to him for even saying that publicly too admitting it yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, so um, that's cool. Bobblehead, Bobblehead Joey's happy that you feel that way. <laughs> I love it when the drivers do that because, uh, you know, it lets people who, who haven't quite been behind the wheel uh, know what's going on in the minds of some of those drivers. So um, I, I could wreck you. <laughs> <laughs> so here's another thing I want to I want to ask. And, and, I'm, and I mean this seriously. So, uh, uh, Jerry, don't be offended, but I know you're not in, you know, early 30s or late 20s but for the rest of us uh i don't think any of us are below 25 are we or we are yeah oh, those two. Oh, those two matt <laughs> matt and <laughs> zach <laughs> uh yeah, they're young and they're young how, how old are you guys if you don't mind 22 20. I'm, i'll be 25 in january okay so zach you're probably closest to this imagine right now at this very moment in your life winning the highest honors of you name it whatever it might be because chase elliott just did this at your age at 24 he's turning 25 actually on my brother's birthday november 28th he's turning 25 and he's a cup champion yeah it, it's uh makes me feel lazy as hell <laughs> <Like I haven't laughs> anything. but no man you get that feeling all the time when you're young especially now in racing with all these all these young drivers um but i mean like in formula one i think hamilton was a champion at like 22 something like that i mean you're getting guys who are just they're succeeding so much at such a young age and uh yeah i've been following chase for a while i remember when he made his cup debut i got to attend that race and i look at his age i'm like damn he's my age and he's in a cup car <laughs> yeah. that's pretty insane i mean i know his dad and everything but i mean you it, it's never easy you know it's never easy to make it to where he is and um, he's he's earned it so much and he's grown as a driver uh, so seeing that and seeing how mature he is and you know he's hard on himself a lot but not just because he's a competitor he wants to win um, but yeah it's it's crazy seeing that and um, yeah good for him you know for one hey, of the I, I, I was I was touring the country at 24 playing professional pool just saying <laughs> on TV <laughs> I was on TV. I was actually, if you can find it, I was the I was the outbreak match. You know the match they show the the guy losing so that the other guy can go on and win. Yeah, I was that guy. I got knocked out of the ESPN Challenge in 1996. I know that y'all weren't born um, at that time, most of you. So, or the other, if you were, you were in diapers. But uh, yeah, there is there is somewhere a video of the ESPN Challenge. And me being the guy that goes out fifth, sixth, rather than going on to go to China and play. Oh, the you didn't win the championship. No worries about no. it. Nope. <laughs> he compared Elliott's career to another individual that's won a championship at a really young age recently is Patrick Mahomes with the Kansas City Chiefs. He won it at 24 um, back in February. Oh, wow. So I, I think if you kind of set aside, kind of look at football and NASCAR and kind of analyze those two career paths, I think they're – pretty similar and uh pretty comparable if you will yeah I'm, I'm even trying to think of like some of the dodger players who are uh young and just won the world series like you know Corey seager's 28 and cody bellinger's 25 you know i can't imagine being that young and then you just won the biggest the biggest thing of them all and whatever your sport or your right. industry is it's it's crazy and, and, then, and then they wonder why they you know they go out and get in trouble because they're kids <laughs> you know they just they got a gazillion dollars and a lot of fame and you know so good thing chase elliott was brought up and, and you know and is a good kid so 
Yeah, I mean, you got to go back in NASCAR specifically. You got to go back to 2004 when Kurt Busch won his title at the age of 25. Jeff Gordon back to 1995 when he won his title at 23. This this doesn't happen. So NASCAR fans, soak this in. This is this is a season that we're probably not going to see for another 15, 20 years, um, oh, possibly. He'll win again next year. Maybe. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, let's go ahead and go on. Um, let's talk about the, the nine that didn't win the championship. Um, were there any surprises? We'll just kind of throw all three series out there because I want to start with um, uh, Chase Briscoe uh, not not winning the championship. And, and it's not that, you know, I don't want to say, you know, Justin Allgaier should have won it or uh, Justin Haley should have had a better setup or whatever it might have been. But I would have never thought that Chase Briscoe was going to finish fourth out of the championship four at Phoenix. I mean, I don't know if there were like Vegas odds to say like, hey, the favorite or one of the favorites for the Xfinity Series going into the championship race is gonna finish last out of all the championship drivers. I I mean, that's like trying to say like New York Yankees are gonna be the first ones out in, in, the, uh, in the playoffs. It's just, it, you don't even think of that. And not only that, but he finishes last out of the playoff drivers. So that was, that was my kind of uh, biggest shock. But um, what about you guys? I think if I had to pick one of all the nine that didn't win, I mean, it just has to go to Brett Moffitt. I mean, he had that win in the bag, and then yellow comes out. I think it was Dawson Cram, uh, just heartbreak. And you could hear it over the radio with the team communications. It was just, and you know, Chase Elliott as he was leading on. I, I didn't hear heartbreak. <laughs> I didn't hear heartbreak over his team radio. <laughs> I heard something way different than heartbreak. I heard pissed offness. He was not happy. Yeah. So <laughs> if I had to pick one, it would definitely be Brett Moffitt. I mean, he had that win in the bag, and to see it lose it, I mean, kind of brought back shades of 2016 in the Cup Series when they had Carl Edwards and they all wrecked going into one. So, um, and then, of course, the flute caution that set that up. So, um, what about you, Zach? Yeah. I mean, I guess when it comes to performance and just who I felt underperformed and the fact that that surprised me, you probably have to go to Denny, Denny Hamlin in the cup. Um, I mean, he, he won the race there last year, but it was under a different package, but I, j I expected a lot more, definitely a lot more fight out of him. Uh, he was pretty quick early, but I mean, at the end, he was, I feel like throughout the day, he was the slowest of the four. Um, he was the only one of the four not to lead and uh, obviously he finished mm -hmm. fourth. Uh, so I just felt like he kind of went down super quietly and, there was no yellows at the end, so he didn't have a, a chance to put up a fight. You know, no one really had a shot. Uh, but still, just the whole day, I, I don't feel like we saw the Denny of 2020 on, on Sunday. I'm with Zach on that. Uh, same with Hamlin. Uh, and again, essentially the same reasons. I, he was a non-factor. And after the season he had this year, his history at Phoenix, at least recent history, it brought back memories of uh, the title he lost in 2010 uh, to Jimmy Johnson. Uh, I believe it was 2010. <clears throat> so, granted, it, it wasn't the same exact scenario, completely different package, completely different uh, rules set up for the playoffs as well, but it he's beginning to feel more and more like this generation's Mark Martin. I mean, I had Briscoe and Hamlin were my two picks for Xfinity and Cup, so I was really surprised with both of those. Um, I thought Briscoe was going to have it in the bag. Um, even though I picked, like, kind of like who I thought would be second or third, I I still thought it was going to be Briscoe. And Hamlin, I definitely thought he was going to do more, um, you know, kind of like Zach said. I was just really surprised. I I thought he had it and like my heart kind of was like oh I want to see Denny win it just because he hadn't and he came he's you know he's done so well but uh, you know at the same time with Chase winning it um, it's really I think it is really good for the sport too though that he won it and I think the merchandise sales alone say so um, I forget what Stern <laughs> Stern tweeted something about the the sales and I was just like whoa like that is insane I forget the exact numbers but a lot. I, yeah, I I believe there that line now racing alone is offering like seventeen or eighteen different versions of the diecast 
Uh, so, Jeez. yeah. Well, I guess as far as the final race, Logano was so strong for the first part of that race. And then all of a sudden, Chase came on. Once he got to the front, I guess for me, I'm surprised that Chase was able to win it. And to not only win it, but dominate it, leading, I think it was it was either 153 or 157 laps. Um, 153. Yeah, it was in my AP report for our AP radio. Um, and I, I, to me, coming from the back, even with a 312 lap race, or 312 mile race, 500 laps, for him to lead that many laps, it's not a surprise that someone did bad it's a surprise that he actually did so well that car was hooked up and and he you could see him maneuvering it through the field from where i was sitting in the press box and it was like he had no cares to give he was gonna go to the front and he was going to win that he was committed to winning that race and he did exactly that so mm -hmm. to do what he did in the dominating fashion that to me was a surprise. Not surprised he won the race. I'm surprised he dominated the way that he did for 153 laps coming from the back. Yeah. Um, but yeah, to move on to kind of uh, follow up with that, you got Chase Elliott, Brad Keselowski, Joey Logano, Denny Hamlin in the top four. Obviously, your championship four drivers. But then the very first driver not in the championship hunt, finishing fifth, his final race of his career, Jimmy Johnson. That's kind of uh, a pretty cool way to cap off his career. And his daughter, I think one of his daughters came up to him and said, like, they, they, thought, his, they thought he won the race or something because he had beat everyone else that wasn't racing right. for he, the championship. She, he, he said he liked her perspective because he, won, he beat everybody that wasn't running for the championship is what she said. Yeah. But for me, for me, it was when Jimmy said over the radio, those burnouts are for Chase. OK, because mm -hmm. they told him to go burn down the tires and, and celebrate his career. And he said, no, those those donuts are for th those are for Chase. And then he did drive around and you could see it on my Twitter that blew up uh, with and high five Chase Elliott um, in between turn three and four. So that was really cool. But the class act of Jimmy Johnson yeah. saying that ain't my place. That's for Chase Elliott. He's the champion. Besides, he's done 90 burnouts, 83 wins, and seven championships. He's done them 90 times, so. Plus, however many uh, all-star race and yeah. uh, shootout yeah, wins. Exactly. <laughs> okay, have I ever told you all my story about Jimmy Johnson? No. Okay, so you just Jimmy have Johnson's one? rookie. What? I, just, <laughs> you I, have, I, have the most I have the most impressive story about Jimmy Johnson. His rookie year. It's pouring down rain at Texas Motor Speedway. Jeff Gordon, I'm in the DO lot. I'm just kind of hanging out, hoping I can get a driver to talk to. I'm early. Now, keep in mind, this is early. This is 19 years. This is like my second year in the sport. I'm not even supposed, sure I'm supposed to be in the DO lot, but I was. <laughs> <laughs> driver owner lot, for those that don't know. Um, Jeff Gordon goes up to the motor coach that Jimmy Johnson was in. Okay, knocks on the door. Jimmy comes out. It's pouring down rain. Jeff tells him, grab an umbrella, and they go down the fence row and sign all the autographs of every fan that's standing out there in the rain. Oh, wow. That was classy. Not only was it classy on Jeff Gordon's part, it was classy on Jimmy Johnson's part. And, and that stood out to me. And I asked him about that one time, and he's like, yeah, he's like, I was wondering who was knocking on the door, and I come to the door, it's Jeff Gordon, he's want me to come out there, and he's like, it's raining. He's like, he didn't care. And they went out there and they signed every every driver or every fan that was out there that wanted an autograph got one that day in the rain at Texas Motor Speedway. That was really classy and cool. Yeah, he was brought up right by Jeff Gordon. I mean, I think for that sure. everyone who got to interview him or just be a fan and just watch him on TV, you can, you can sense the class that Jeff had. Um, I'm not saying that Jimmy would not have been a great person independently. Um, he definitely proved to be. Uh, but having Jeff in his corner from the very beginning and having him as a teammate for, I mean, what was it, 15, 15 seasons, 16, uh, that, that really led him down a, a great path. And, and it, it, that class definitely showed on Sunday. Uh, you know, we, we kind of saw it, and we, we didn't know what post-race was going to be like. Uh, even when Chase won, I wasn't even thinking about Jimmy. 
Um, and then we saw him kind of come by doing a, a Kowicki lap. And uh, we're like, is he going to do a burnout? I don't know. And we're like, oh, it'll, it'll kind of take the, the spice away from seeing Chase win. Um, and he didn't. And uh, they, he ended up meeting him in, uh, in the middle of three and four and gave him a high five and um, got a great picture of him just waving to the fans as he drove past us. It was just uh, one of those moments that, you know, you work in the sport long enough. That's one thing that you hope you get to see. And I, I told Matt um, after, especially a driver who has such a long, long career. I mean, we're talking race car drivers. So it's a blessing when you get to see a race car driver end their career hugging his kids healthy. And, you know, he ended the career the way that he wanted to. And uh, that was something that I really took took away from that as a, as a huge positive and just a beautiful moment. Hey, where were you guys sitting at? We were middle of three and four. Okay, I didn't know where you were at when I was when I was at the, when I was in the press box. I had no clue. Y'all never let me know, but uh, wish I'd have known. But anyway, yeah, y'all had a great view of yeah. uh, of, of that that uh, moment between the two of them. Yeah, the championship stage was down on the track. Probably if you were like dead center of the stage, was probably like two sections to our right. Okay, cool for y'all. Although, glad, y'all got, glad you got to go out there. And although, to be fair. It is the end of his full-time cup career. I don't know if he has any plans to come back and run part-time at all or not, but he is moving over to IndyCar for the road course races next year, driving for Chip Ganassi in the Carvana number 48. Awesome. Uh, I saw Jimmy post a video on social media. I want to say it was Monday or Tuesday, and it's just so strange already to see him decked out in Chip Ganassi racing gear. (laughs) Yeah, he, he... I think he was testing at Laguna Seca. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah they get to test, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> Before we go any further, real quick, guys, um, I, since we since they brought up a car and a number and everything, um, our driver, Ryder Wells, who came in second in his uh, season and track champion uh, at, at uh, Gulf Coast Speedway, is entered and accepted in the Tulsa shootout. And he will be driving the number 24 car, his Ooh. car number. He actually got it. So that was really cool. Um, so I just wanted to uh, shout out to Ryder. And uh, I've got a story coming out uh, the next few days on his season and what he's looking forward to going to the Tulsa shootout. I'll be there for that. Um, I guess that's in January, I believe. Uh, but I know it's just going to be really, really cold. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but we'll, uh, we'll be bringing you action. Uh, in the off season for uh, for riders uh, next uh, big deal and this weekend Kenny Wallace is going to be at 105 Speedway where Ryder actually races um, in Cleveland Ooh. Texas Kenny's going to be there this weekend and I've already reached out to him so I'll be seeing Kenny Wallace this weekend maybe I'll uh, we got to do a quick like interview we could have Justin you know edit it into the podcast or something yeah next week yeah, and I need to get with uh, Boris said because his uh, he's um, he's coaching and getting his kid racing his uh, go kart at our uh, at our local club out here in California. So Moffitt to our motorsports, and the officially official notification that he was no longer a part of GMS Racing. For those who did not know that he was no longer a part of GMS Racing, all you had to do was listen to his post race interview from Phoenix to know that they were done. Okay, he burned, he didn't just burn the bridge to GMS. He took like nitroglycerin <laughs> and sent it up in, you know, a million pieces. So yeah, the GMS, uh, the GMS uh, people put out a, a notification statement today that uh, we are no longer uh, affiliated with, with Brett Moffitt. Brett Moffitt's no longer affiliated with us. And Moffitt put out his thing that he's going to our motorsports in 2021 in the Xfinity series. So good for them. Don't know who the sponsor is going to be. Maybe, maybe I'll do. I didn't uh, see that. I, uh, I believe free auctions is sponsoring four races. Other than that, I haven't seen anything. Okay. So, so that's a, that's a quick one. And then you've got the thing that I didn't see coming and maybe yeah. somebody can tell me about it. Hemrick to JGR. Where's the money coming from? Who's the sponsors? How did that come about? I, I'd heard a little bit about this uh, in the past week or so, except the way I heard it was that he was going to be splitting the ride with others. Apparently, he's going to be full-time. Uh, some of the sponsors are uh, his longtime sponsors, Poppy Bank, uh, 
South Point Casino. Uh, at least that's what he was saying on Sirius XM today. And then some other sponsors are brand new to the sport, that they're still working on things. Uh, but he is going to be full-time, and I think this is his best opportunity to compete in NASCAR, at least at this point in his career. He's going to the number one Xfinity team in the yeah yeah in, in the garage. So if he can't get it done there, uh, I hate to say this, Daniel, but you might want to rethink things at this point because they, you know, you you've had some good rides. You haven't had great rides, but this is a great Xfinity ride. So yeah. uh, we'll see what he can do. This is his shot. Here's the question though: uh, Gibbs has three cars in the Xfinity series with the you know eighteen, nineteen, twenty. That's uh, Riley Earps right now on the eighteen. And then Brandon Jones in the 19, Harrison Burton in the 20. Riley's gone. So Riley is gone. Okay, I wasn't yeah, sure Riley if they were adding no a fourth part card. of the team. He's gone. Okay. Riley put out a statement today uh, thanking JGR and Coach Gibbs for uh, the opportunities that he's give, been given. And he is moving on. Uh, I, I Just think look I'm for pro- Stuart Haas. Yeah. 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 He's going, mo, mo, the way I understand it, he's going to Stuart Haas. That, that announcement was already supposed to be made. It hasn't been made. Monster is notorious for delaying things to the end. Um, so, um, and, and, you know, not speaking ill of Monster or anything like that, but I know how their sponsorships work, and sometimes they say they'll do something at the last minute they pull out and they or they forget. And they, uh, but, you know, that, but I think that deal will come together with Stuart Haas. It didn't come together with kicking the tires, but, you know, we tried. <laughs> Gotcha. Yeah, so he's going to be in the 18 uh, <laughs> next year. Those are your people out there in California, by the way, Justin. I have no comment. <laughs> I do not identify as a Californian. So, look, look, I can't say I can't say too much about Monster. They've done they've done the sport well. They do Kurt Busch well. I just wish we could have put a deal together with them. It yeah. would have really helped out kicking the tires and we could have we could have had that sponsorship that we were we were working on. It just, you know, stuff happens it's all the insider news that we can give that might pique your interest <laughs> there you go yeah i got right. some insider news but we don't want to talk about it <laughs> well uh one one thing i do want you to chat a little bit about jerry is uh, a suspension for a driver because obviously here we are end of the season silly season's not done because obviously we've got um daniel hemrick going to jgr we've got brett moffitt going to our motorsports and kind of graduating into the xfinity series ty dillon doesn't have a ride yet I guess we're still waiting to see what Myatt Snyder has for the Xfinity Series. I think that's really the only big name that still has a question mark next to it. So you're talking, you were asking about the suspension, Josh Rayon. That's right. Um, source confided into me this past week, very powerful, very, very good source, confided in me and provided me with documentation of uh, an anti-Semitic um, posting that Josh Rayon put on his social media platforms. And it was disturbing. It was uncalled for. And honestly, just stupid. And for complete 100% transparency, Seth Eggert is Jewish. Um, And I have reached out over this issue to a couple of Jewish friends of mine, um, Louis Frank being one of them, just to ask the difficulties of uh, of what this swastika means and how how, how they view it, um, and that's what it was. And you know, it shouldn't have happened. Josh's excuse was atrocious, uh, in my opinion. And I like Josh, but he's going to be involved in NASCAR sensitivity program for a while, and I think he'll be a changed person when it's all said and done. Uh, people make mistakes. They're entitled to say I'm sorry, and they're entitled to a uh, second chance. Um, but he uh, he is the co-team owner with Realm Brothers Racing. Uh, mm-hmm. He's also the driver of the number double zero um, uh, for the for that team. Don't know what that means, but most likely Josh will end up coming back. You know, at the beginning of next year. Um, but I've heard that program. It's like 12 to 14 weeks is not easy it's not like you know they instill a lot into you so uh so, you know maybe maybe a lot of us should be able should actually go uh should, should take something like that because yeah. i didn't realize how bad it, i knew how bad it affected me 
I didn't know how, how bad it affected someone else. And I usually don't get too upset over stuff, but this one actually, this one actually bugged me. So, uh, so shame on Josh for, uh, for putting the swastika out there. Yeah. And and Seth, if you want to comment, I'd appreciate it. Uh, yeah. Uh, yes, I'm Jewish, but also, uh, both of my grandparents, um, my, my mother's side survived the concentration camps in World War II. Uh, when I saw that, uh, uh, on Tuesday, a, a, a few people reached out to make sure I was okay. And mm -hmm. honestly, I was more pissed than anything. Uh, I probably told them I was okay and not how I was actually feeling. <laughs> um, uh, it, I've dealt with anti-Semitism throughout my entire life, whether it's because of my grandparents surviving the camps, uh, stuff my sister went through uh, about 22 years ago. And it, it it's something I've always lived with. It's something that's always in the back of my mind, that even when I go just out and about, just because it's something that ingrained for me. So uh, it, it it's tough. And I actually put it on... Uh, Twitter and on Facebook, uh, just some song lyrics from a family friend uh, that uh, he, he wrote a song to honor his grandparents, uh, uh, who some who survived the camp, some who didn't. So uh, his name is Sam Blazer. Uh, if you want to check out my social media post, uh, it's on Twitter, it's on Facebook. But uh, it it it's something I never expected to see in. NASCAR. Uh, granted, I know there's Southern Roots and this and that, but it's it's something I just didn't expect to get close to home. Hmm. Well, I applaud NASCAR for taking the the steps that they've taken. Uh, they did it swiftly um, because I know this came up uh, according to Josh's post. It was last week that it was posted. They I heard about it um, not long after it happened. And NASCAR obviously uh, heard about it from apparently the same source that told me, and they took action and they asked, they contacted Josh, got their answer and moved swiftly. Uh, I think that speaks volumes of how serious NASCAR is taking the uh, diversity effort uh, that this sport needs, uh, obviously more than some of us realize. So yeah. well, moving on, uh, I guess, what else do we have to talk about? I mean, we, we kind of touched on Steve Phelps' statements about overcoming uh, the COVID season. Um, yeah, it was for him. He said uh, it was a, it was one of the diffi most difficult um, that he had. He said, I'll, I'll read you this quote. It says, when we were here the last time and we raced here on March 8th, referring to Phoenix, we were focused on how is that, how is that short track package going to work? It was up in the air. We weren't sure. We thought it was going to be great by the way it was. Then three, four days later, the world goes crazy, right? We're just in a situation, we were just in a situation that was unthinkable. What I would say is that on March 8th, we were a sport that was coming back, right? Our ratings had stabilized last year. Our attendance was going in the correct direction. If you think about where we are as a sport today, I believe we are stronger as a sport today than we were pre-COVID. Is it where we want to be? Of course not. But are we financially viable to move forward? We are. Do I think the majority of our race teams are in the same position? I do. We came through a very difficult time. Phelps talked about uh, three different things in that statement, but the most important to me seems to be the viability of the sport and whether or not um, mm -hmm. you know we almost lost NASCAR. I know from some of the teams that I've talked to that they were on the brink um, another shutdown would be catastrophic for NASCAR. Um, could they survive? Would they survive? Sure, probably, maybe. Um, would some of the teams? I don't think so. Yeah. Um, I, I know some of the teams were, were very close. Uh, but for even for us here at Kicking the Tires, as the owner of Kicking the Tires, our finances haven't been the best because we haven't gotten the revenue that we normally get. And that mm -hmm. has affected, that has affected y'all. And I appreciate the understanding you guys have. Um, but yeah, we'll turn it around. We're going to be here and we're going to be here for as long as, uh, as long as they let us uh, keep coming to the garage. 
and every one of y'all is welcome to uh to come back just like summer and any you know the rest of the staff so uh we uh we want to keep making this even bigger and better so what are y'all's thoughts on the big issues of 2020 now that we're at the end of the season uh looking back on how we came through this COVID issue and sarah you haven't said a whole lot on the show but <laughs> you went through COVID. you actually i'm not talking on a term you made it public you went through the virus and and came out okay um but i don't know how many people actually know that and and what you had had to deal with so i mean first i want to like kind of hit on like nascar in, in 2020 i mean you know it started out like i covered my first daytona 500 i mean that was crazy as we know i mean you know seth and and zach zach was on pit road i saw him with his camera i was standing there you know you know seth when it happened matt i think you were in the press box i think yeah, I didn't um stay for the... oh you didn't stay for that day that's right my bad i don't want to hit on that 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 was bad i felt bad um but that was crazy um you know and i was so happy i got to cover that uh you know first 500 it's nothing like daytona that's for sure um and then of course i was supposed to cover atlanta and i was on a plane and everything just kind of like foiled at that point um and you know truly blessed that i got to cover new hampshire um first time in the press box and it was it was it wasn't the same i mean it was it wasn't that same vibe that you get during the race weekend you don't have that infield access and but i'm still lucky i got to do it and i think nascar you know they did a great job i mean things could have went totally the other way um i think they handled it a lot better than a lot of other sports not to put you know any other sports down but i think they handled it the right way and for somebody that you know, went through it and I never want to go through it ever again. Um, and I'm kind of scared because there's, you know, a lot of, everyone has their own opinion about it, but my doctor told me like, there's a chance there's, you know, so many strains of it that they're still trying to figure it all out. And there's a lot hmm. of questions that they don't know. And I don't want to deal with that again. It was literally probably the worst time in my life. Um, I had people just texting me to check on me and make sure I was like still breathing um and it's like a touchy subject for me because some people believe in it and some people don't and some people think it's you know just like the regular flu and my personal opinion is there's like similarities like I saw a lot of similarities with the flu but it's it's totally different I mean it's going to affect everybody differently too so I can only speak for me yeah um but I mean, it was a crazy, you know, it's just a crazy year. I mean, I never thought that, you know, at this time last year, I was getting ready to leave for Homestead or just getting into Homestead. And then you look at 2020 and we're like, no infield access. We have to wear masks around each other, you know, and it's just, I don't know. It's just crazy. Um, I mean, I hope 2021 is a little bit more normal, so to speak, and we can kind of get back to doing what we're used to doing. <laughs> Zach, you and Matt have covered some races um, that I didn't go to. Uh, what was it like for you guys to, uh, looking back on this season? And what are you happy about? What are you glad that's over? Well, yeah, uh, this year I ended up going to 20 cup races somehow, um, starting with Daytona, which was the greatest energy I've ever felt from a group of humans was the Daytona 500 this year um, on that Sunday, um, even before the president showed up. I mean, just having 100,000 people there, new season, it's always exciting, but just that moment and that day, I've never felt that type. And that's coming from four Indy 500s, um, but Daytona, nothing nothing topped it. Coming from that, and then, uh, you know, me and Jerry were in Atlanta when the sport shut down, and uh, we're in Darlington when it opened back up, and uh, Throughout the summer, I covered nine straight, and most of them didn't have any fans at all. And then I'm here at Phoenix at the end of the season, attending a race for the first time in about half a decade, and um, with fans around me. Um, so going from just something that felt uh, kind of normal in the beginning of the year, but just elevated to literally just, I mean, bare bones. I mean, just all the excitement, all the events, the feeling of an event when you go to a race with the people and the uh, the campers and just the, the hot dog vendors, just every little thing. Um, you almost don't notice it until it's taken out. 
and then it's like taking out all the colors in a painting you know and you're like man this is black and white there's just nothing you just show up and there's a race and that's all you go home it's dead silent afterwards um uh, so it was just an, an unbelievable uh season i mean i still had a great time but um I, i've always tried to stay really appreciative of of what we got to do as media when it came to our access uh, but having a year where we didn't get to do anything like we saw Ross Chastain at dinner um, over the weekend and, and we talked that was the first time we saw a driver face to face since uh, February and uh, it was uh, it was kind of tough to think about it that way but yeah you just don't get to talk to anybody anymore and when you do you can't give them a high five you can't give them a hug you can't smile at them because you have a mask on there's just a lot that's missing so uh, it, it was a crazy year, but I think we, we learned a lot. And um, there's no way next year uh, is it going to be uh, more fun than this year. Sure, yeah. I, the season started off pretty sour. Uh, I wasn't able to stay for the delayed Daytona 500 on Monday because of rain. Um, and then I wasn't didn't do any of the West Coast swing. I was going to go to Atlanta. And then, um, of course, that's where everything shut down. Um, then didn't really go to any races until the all-star race when Bristol really took the step forward and opened up the 30,000 fans back in uh, July. And at the time, I, I mean, that Bristol is my home track and I was like, you know, like, I don't care what it takes. Like I'm going to the race at Bristol cause I had missed the spring race. Cause um, I think at the time they were only allowing four reporters in the press box. So, and me outside. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, um, missing that Bristol race and then getting to go in July with 30,000 people um, felt, it didn't really feel uneasy to me, but it was just like being a part of history, you know, and I'm sure a lot of major sports were watching NASCAR and as I know they were um, as to how the protocols were handled, mm -hmm. um, never felt unsafe or every or anything. And then um, I was also fortunate enough to purchase tickets like this past weekend, just, just to be able to get to the racetrack, um, Talladega gateway, um, I saw my first IndyCar race this year. Um, talent, yeah. So uh, for me, I, I view racing as entertainment also. And whenever you're stuck inside for eight months and just slaving away at Amazon, you really just want to get out, get outside, enjoy some normalcy. And uh, I'm thankful to be centralized here in Tennessee to a, quite a few different racetracks that I can make it to in a day's drive. But um, I did cover bristol and martinsville um for kicking the tires and it didn't really hit me because I, I went to all these races in the fall but it didn't really hit me until martinsville where i saw a thousand people in the grandstands that wow like this is horrible you know because all the other races i had been to felt somewhat normal you know for so uh it was such a crazy year i'm i'm glad i got to see um phoenix and jimmy's last race um just being a part of that cool history and I'm hoping 2021 is a lot better. I know NASCAR tested some new policies this past weekend, even with fans in the infield. So uh, yeah. it'll be interesting to see what they were able to gather data-wise from Phoenix and apply to the rest of next season. Seth, what about you? I know that you only got to do the 500, if I recall. You were supposed to do Martinsville and had to bow out at the last minute, but uh, you helped us from the sidelines and monitored stuff and helped tweet as well as Sarah. So keeping everything up to date on the site and what you've done, I, I greatly appreciate it. But talk about, about your year and kind of recap how you put it all together. Well, for me, uh, I went down to Daytona. I actually carpooled with uh, Jacob Seelman and Peter, uh, Peter Strada from uh, two different outlets. But uh, it, I was actually looking forward. My next race after Daytona was supposed to be Atlanta. And I had plans to go to Atlanta, to Richmond, Martinsville, Charlotte, uh, Bristol, Darlington. I mean, I was going to go to somewhere around 10 to 12 races this year. And uh, with the virus, obviously, that changed everything. Uh, but I was covering uh, the e-NASCAR portion of the sport. And when the, the sport shut down and turned to iRacing, uh, I went and covered the e-NASCAR iRacing Pro Invitational, Saturday Night Thunder, uh, the various different leagues that popped up, whether it was the Leaf Filter replacements, uh, the Coke Series, which that was already established, uh, Road to Pro, and now during the off-season, there's the iRacing Pro Series, which starts up next week. 
plus there's some other leagues as well, whether it's uh, Monday Night Racing, which you and I compete in, and Schuler from time to time. Yeah. Uh, and I was the sponsor. Yeah, you were the sponsor. Well, we, we we were the sponsor. Yeah. Kicking the tires was the sponsor. Uh, I know uh, Lower Half Dash, uh, we Ryan Ellis. That again. Yeah, I was going to say Ryan Ellis and uh, uh, Cody Ware were talking about that recently. Oh, cool. Uh, and then on top of that, uh, Friday night, uh, tomorrow night, is the Hard to Drive 300 that Garrett Smithley, Parker Klingerman, Landon Castle, and a few others are attempting to qualify for right now as we speak. <laughs> uh, it is the 900 horsepower old COT at Atlanta Motor Speedway, and you get one set of tires. Ooh. Wow. Yeah. Interesting. So, you know, you're lucky you covered, like, multiple full seasons because of the <laughs> yeah. parts. You know, uh, and, yeah, and I, and I have at least one more this year. <laughs> yeah, and, and you got Justin over here, who he got to go to Vegas. Twice. A couple times, twice. Yeah. And then uh, and then California, obviously. But, um, yeah. Yeah, and then this was supposed to be our first championship race um, this, uh, this past weekend. So I know Rachel was super bummed because she was really looking forward to that. Um, but, yeah, it's... It's been quite an interesting uh, year because uh, I feel like, uh, at least for me and Rachel, uh, well, well, actually, let me let me take a step back because Rachel did not get to do photos at the second Vegas race, um, so I was really the only one that, uh, out out of the two of us at least, that really got to experience the before and after or the before and during, I should say, of of COVID and and uh, man, when Vegas when they announced no one was going to be at the track and stuff like that, I I was. I knew it was going to be, well, I wouldn't say bad, but just, um, I, I'm trying to find the right word for it, but it was, it was almost just like a ghost town at the track. Like I had no clue there was a, it, there were times I literally felt like, is there really a race going on today or tonight or whatever? And sure enough, oh, look, they're lined up there on pit road and. But Rachel got to cover um, the the truck race on Friday because I had that work meeting, and then Saturday and Sunday I covered Xfinity and Cup. So uh, I guess she did kind of get to uh, experience it a little bit. But um, yeah, I think I think in your article, you know, and, and we talked about it a couple times before. You know, NASCAR. I, I don't think I don't think people realize how much of not just the NASCAR fan base, but how much of the world was watching NASCAR this year probably more than ever because not only did you have covid um uh and all of that going on you had all the controversy with the with the package and and everyone's still uh fighting and griping over that but then you had larson's whole situation right there during the pandemic right there when when there's no sports no racing going on at all um so that got all of the non-nascar fans non-nascar followers uh turning their eyes all of a sudden i had work i i had work friends who had who have never watched a race in their life asking me about that like they would never come up to me and ask me about nascar all of a sudden they're left and right like what's what's up with this with this with this driver guy uh uh doing that and stuff like that so um I th I don't think people realize how much pressure NASCAR was under uh, this year, kind of having all of these curveballs tossed at them at the same time. But um, I hope they never have to go through that ever again. <laughs> but well, they got twenty twenty, they got twenty twenty all the way through the year. <laughs> yeah, but um, that's the new cuss word twenty 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 you. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. I'll just I'll just put a little beep right there. Um, <laughs> But uh, I'll tell you what, to, to see the end result um, and honestly, miraculously pulling together all 36 races the way they did, um, you know, knowing that we can uh, and, and nobody, nobody in that organization believes in can't, uh, nobody believes in impossible. Uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a true leader. And I think NASCAR has really set themselves you know at the forefront of you know this as far as the sports industry is you know people who may not believe sports is is a thing and or sports uh, especially nascar not being a sport i think uh, i think it's changed a lot of their minds because of of the leadership the nascar has so yeah and just I, um... one thing i remember uh saying um early on this was probably may or so 
um, because I, I covered quite a few from my car because they, it was such a limited amount in a press box. So I'd be outside the stands. And um, I, I said, like, it was instead of waiting for it, for all this to come to an end before NASCAR competes, NASCAR found a way to compete within uh, the situation and do it in a safe manner and um, let it so everyone can do their job and, and let the drivers be safe and just do all that. So how they were able to, to work a, not around the situation, but through it and do it the way that they did. And as you said, complete all 36 races on time. Uh, that was just unlike anything I could have ever imagined. Yeah, I just wanted to um, like add in that if, you know, if 2020s made me realize anything, especially about covering NASCAR, is how appreciative, you know, we should all be about the access that we usually have. Um, there's, I don't know many other sports that give their media, you know, the access that we usually have. And mm -hmm. it's completely eye-opening to me that, you know, we're used to our routine and, you know, we can go get our interviews and, you know, Zach, or who are, you know, anyone that does photos, they go get the photos that they want. And it's just, you know, to not have that infield access and to have, you know, to be able to do what we normally do, it, it really made me appreciate this year what we normally have um, and not to take it for granted um, because we don't know, we don't know when we're going to have it again. I mean, I hope that 2021 is more normal, but, it's just really made me really grateful um, to be able to do this. And, you know, that Jerry has given me the chance to be able to do this because I talk to people at, at work all the time that I've at the new job, there's like a bunch of NASCAR fans. And they're like, what do you do? And like, I gave them the, my card because they're like, oh, I want to check out the website. And I was like, yeah, yeah, go give us like a like and everything. But um, it's just crazy. Like, like, follow, what? share. Like, follow, share. Subscribe. <laughs> they're they're in awe they're like you get to do that and like they want to see photos and hear all about it and they're like that's crazy and yeah. so it's just you know i'm just very grateful and appreciative and you know nascar did a nascar just did a great job i think this year one thing i want to do is ask jerry i mean you've asked all of us about our seasons but yours i mean you started with the 500 and then you travel all the way across the globe and the world shuts down and <laughs> Go to Darlington and get the video of the haulers driving in. Just so, um, real quick, Zach, you're going to cover a test on Monday in my place because I can't be there. Uh, so thank you for doing that. They're going to have the two uh, Gen 7 cars at, uh, at at Charlotte Motor Speedway. Bring your camera. Make sure you get some good photos. Um, and uh, and put you know we'll have we'll do a photo collage or something on the on the site as well as uh, the social media and stuff. Uh, let us know how we can help you with that from afar. Um, and uh, like I said, appreciate you being able to, to uh, sub in for me because obviously I'm in Texas, which has been a big problem this year because normally I would be on the road like two or three times, three weeks at a time. Um, I did. I started off in Daytona. Uh, I'd been, I was there for 11 days. I came back um, and immediately turned around and flew to India uh and was in india for 12 days 12 13 days um and then the world shut down as uh, as matt said i came back three days before they shut down the borders now i would have gotten in anyway but i definitely could tell a whole difference in the dynamic of how things were being handled in different parts of the world based on where i was at i was actually at a dinner um with the health minister of India uh, when they uh, and there's maybe video or tw a tweet at the time um, I know I put it out there he got a phone call he was doing the keynote speech for this dinner and he got a phone call that he had to take and it was their first confirmed COVID case in India oh, and wow. he actually had to leave that dinner that I was at um, to go to uh, uh, an emergency meeting of the India Parliament and the Indian government, uh, and yeah, I'm, I mean, I was in Hyderabad, India, um, so you can't get very much further on the other side of the world, um, and it was hmm. uh, it was eye opening to see how things were. And then I have friends that are in India, and they were telling me how they were handling COVID uh, and how they were they were under lockdown, 
And look, let me tell you something. Lockdown in India is a hell of a lot different than lockdown in America. Oh, jeez. Um, because she, they, they, one of the people that I'm friends with, they sent me video of someone who was not wearing a mask and who was out in public, and they were beating them with bamboo sticks to get them to go back into their homes. It was it was quite ugly. Oh, wow. um, yeah, the police police took it very seriously. There, for a country of 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 one point one point five billion, I believe, 1.4 billion. Um, there was nobody hardly on the streets. And when I was there, there was, there's video out there of the, of how many people were on the streets. It's crazy, the traffic and everything. So, so dealing with that and then coming back to our country and NASCAR shutting down the minute I walk onto the facility at Atlanta Motor Speedway. Um, and then we're gone for what, eight, nine weeks. We, we had nothing. Um, that's when I invested in iRacing and uh and started learning how to do that we started the lower half dash we tried to diversify we were the only media website out there at the time that was sponsoring iRacing to diversify um and bring people into the sport um through through that media we started with the lower half dash i did some one-off races and then we did the monday night racing we're going to do some more uh, uh sponsorships as well um but we were trying to even though our revenue stream was was struggling um we were trying to keep our name relevant in the sport and i think a lot of the drivers i know a lot of the drivers because i got some texts from them um and i know they appreciated us keeping them uh involved and keeping their names out there and things like that as far as covering races i went to every race i could um you know i tried to get zach and and matt and sarah and anybody who wanted to go my goal this year for the company was that everybody cover at least one race after daytona um seth didn't work out because of a, of a family emergency but you know i owe you one and, and but it, it, that that type of stuff happens family yeah. comes first you know family is first here and, and and you know we were able to sub in matt was able to to take care of it but everybody got to do something and that was very important to me that everybody got to cover a race this year uh in in the times that it was so i want to thank everybody um i want to thank y'all for coming and and trusting me and trusting kicking the tires and this brand is important to me and uh every one of you guys uh is important to me every part of kicking the tires every person who puts it together and makes it happen uh means the world to me and you guys you, you really don't know how 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 much i care and how much i appreciate uh, all that you do because i know that i slack sometimes on writing stuff and things like that and uh, it's because i'm trying to get the next big story that will get us the most hits and because that's what pays the bills you know and uh justin worked his butt off when we crashed earlier this year um we got hacked let's see 2020 <laughs> it happened we got nascar got shut down uh, we got hacked and, 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 and then we got like destroyed again, three days before Texas Motor Speedway, a big home race for us. Yeah. And Justin's up like 48 hours straight. I'm up like 24 hours straight. We're all trying to, he and I are trying to redo the site and we're not telling anybody what the hell's going on because we didn't want everybody to know that it was in complete chaos. <laughs> I'm in a hotel room in Dallas trying to figure out he's at his house. And we're trying to figure out how can we even have a website right now. But we did. And our archives are getting, you know, slowly, surely going to get put back up. And uh, all of everybody's commit, you know, contributions are there. So yep. we're closing out 2020. I'm so glad to put it in the review mirror. We're not going to keep, uh, you know, we're not going to ki- uh, kill the podcast in the off season right now. I think we're going to continue to go for a little while and see what happens. I think we're going to see what kind of content we have. Uh, they may get a little bit shorter. Uh, but this is uh, this is an extra long one here tonight. But I appreciate everything you've done. Thanks for sticking it, sticking out in 2020. That's going to do it here for the Kicking Show, episode number 11, season finale. We'll see you next week.